Shamai, welcome. Today we've got uh, an interview with Francesco Renzi. Um, he's someone he's I always I find it quite interesting on Twitter. We so there's some people on Twitter you kind of continually collide with, um, and although we, we we often don't agree on things, we're able to express our ideas in uh, quite a constructive way. Um, so uh, I thought it'd be interesting just to have a little into. And he he actually works, you know, sort of in the cryptocurrency world. Um, uh, which I'll, I'll let him explain in a moment. Um, uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to, to have a little conversation with him, uh, find out what his interests are, because some of his interests do align with mine, so I'd like to explore those. And then uh, also what he um, what he hopes for the future and um, his relationship with Bitcoin specifically. So, um, uh, so Francesco, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Francesco Renzi. I work for a company called Decentral in Estonia. And we basically build applications for uh, third parties in the blockchain space. So we're mostly focused on Ethereum, but we, we're we all Bitcoiners in some way. So, yeah, I often get to uh, have lively conversations on Twitter with Ben. So hopefully we can uh, replicate that in, uh, in a video this time. And yeah, yeah. Well, let's see where it takes us. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is kind of my what interests me is because I am I'm interested in in the idea of like tokenized assets and uh, DAOs and all this sort of stuff. Um, and Ethereum has been somewhat of like a, a, the, the, it's been the playground. It's been the it's been the the platform which people have been able to use to to try and build these things. Um, but then sometimes you'll find people in that sort of who've got their you know at their elbow deep in in the ICO type world, and that they're, they're clearly just scammers. Um, whereas you very much seem to be someone who is actually interested in the, the technology. Um, and I think it helps if you're, you know, a Bitcoiner first. Um, uh, um, and and, and you, you clearly are, you know, a, a Bitcoiner. <laughs> well, let's say I'm uh, agnostic. I don't really care who succeeds as long as someone does. Uh, I hedge my bets between Bitcoin and Ethereum at the moment. But uh, I'm really agnostic. I mean, uh I don't have any time for people who think uh, Ethereum will succeed or Bitcoin will succeed because the true fact is nobody knows. So it's just a stupid way of living, in my opinion. I'd rather hedge my bets, uh, build where I can, which is not Bitcoin at the moment, and you know, and then see where the market takes us. You know, you just have. I have bags in Bitcoin and in Ethereum, so you know, I'm not gonna lose out if either of them ditches the other and starts running on their own so. yeah i mean i i i have often because uh, there's been a few times where i've had conversations with sort of known maximalist types um uh now i you know i'm 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 i think bitcoin would be the, the, the backbone of future society but i am prepared and i continually remind myself that the whole thing could just go tits up and then you know it breaks and we lose everything um uh because you know it's it's a it's, it's a computer science experiment. It's a very successful computer science experiment. It looks incredibly resilient, and like it's not. And a lot of people have a lot of confidence confidence in it. Uh, but you, you see people in the space. You know, someone like Adam Back, who's been um, you know exploring uh, cryptography and, and public key cryptography, and um, you know worked with the Cypherpunk for, for for many many years uh, pre Bitcoin. Um, and and he, he's very calm. Um, he's, he's focused on Bitcoin and that's his area which he wants to explore but I'm sure he's like completely prepared for it to if it were all to, to, to break down and collapse like he would just continue working trying to build something with the, the, the um, uh, something with the qualities which 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 um, you know he hopes Bitcoin has and, and Bitcoin yeah. can be stable um, but sometimes I'll speak to you know some of these no maximalist types and and I know that if if Bitcoin were to to, to break or which i think is so incredibly unlikely you know but it, it's still worth thinking of um to try and be a, a realist over this it's only only a 10 year old project um that they would be destroyed you know they they would they would have serious mental health issues because they've, they've poured so much of themselves into bitcoin um uh um they, they i mean i've met a few people who burnt out as well you know like um uh, when when Bitcoin went into the bear market and started to crash, and they they suffered serious mental illness from it, like serious mental illness, you know, where, where the, the sorts of things which could lead people to do bad things, and yeah. um, people who put all their their eggs in one basket, uh, 
um, uh, and, uh, um, and have this kind of like blind faith in the system, um, they're going to be real, truly heartbroken if, if it doesn't work out. So I think there, there is some wisdom in a being sort of open to, I mean, other projects um, and why people would invest time in other projects and then be just, just not putting all your eggs in one basket and not, not, yeah. you, you can have a faith in a system which is going to work, but also keep forcing yourself to reminding yourself that, look, if this doesn't work, what's next? You know, what am I going to do next? <laughs> Yeah, well, to be fair, I am a crypto triumphalist. I don't see this failing at the moment. Um, not because of I have a particularly strong faith in Bitcoin or Ethereum, but as you said, because there are people who have dedicated their life to this. There are people who dedicate their life to creating systems which can't be censored, captured, and uh, destroyed. So if this time round isn't the right time, I'm sure there will be a next one. So I'm not uh, too worried about that, honestly. Also, I do think, I mean, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and possibly only these two are decentralized enough to, at the moment at least, be quite resilient. Uh, I'm not sure if there are, maybe Monero might be quite resilient too. I'm not, I'm not too deep into them, but in general, I don't think most of the so-called cryptocurrencies are actually resilient because in the end, if you think of it, things like EOS are literally run by, you know, a bunch of people who, who are all perfectly identified. So, you know, it could be shut down any day. It's mm. not, that's not what I'm interested in. So do you think if, I mean, if say, say if Vitalik were to be black bagged, um, and then you know a gun put to his head, or if someone was to get some uh, some leverage on him, do you think that they could persuade him to affect the protocol? No. Well, yeah, but he couldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. If people wouldn't run the, the node software, no. which no, it would no, yeah. but it wouldn't even get past that. I mean, look, two two years ago, you know that you know there was that incident where people thought he died. But we've gone way past that. And he knows. I mean, I think he was actually kind of scared of what was happening and tried to defuse his, let's say, personality cult. So he kind of stepped back and it's I think it's really been noticed. I mean, if you look if you look now, there are a lot of people taking up kind of leadership roles, talking on their own voice, not waiting for Vitalik to set the pace. I mean, he's still there, obviously, but I don't think it would affect uh, Ethereum as much as it would have two years ago. What it will affect is the price, clearly, because the, you know, I mean, I'm talking people who are in the space, but people who are not in the space will definitely react to news like that, you know, but they would react, they might react the same way, you know, if, well, now maybe there's no similar person in Bitcoin, but. I think it's uh, it's something that would definitely impact the price short term, but I don't think it would impact the com developer community. Not not really. I mean, I I don't honestly personally. I'm not sure how much of the work he's even doing. And like, he's not the person I engage with when I when I want to ask where we're going. So I don't. Yeah. That personality cult is kind of has been diffused successfully, in my opinion. There's still work to do for the market. You know, the market needs other people to look to for news and, you know, all these uh, cryptocurrency news outlets who basically just parrot things they find on Twitter. They would probably need some other people to parrot because at the moment they just talk about whatever. As soon as Vitalik tweets something, they just you know go crazy and write news about it and obviously if something happened to him they would just tank the price just like that but it's just the price i do think there's more there's more to it than just vitalic boots right yeah okay okay well that's, that's i think that's probably fair um i mean i mean the the, the idea of being able to because obviously in bitcoin those uh binance um had this uh, crazy idea that you know, it could roll back the blockchain um and then people obviously then thought about the ethereum example you know um, um, with Ethereum Classic and that kind of debacle. Um, and I think there was, you know, from what I heard from people, they collectively thought that, yeah, this, it wouldn't happen on Ethereum either now. You know, it was only possible, it was only no. 
it could only happen then because the, 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 we had such small liquidity. There's so few people involved. Um, um, the, but, but it was so early on in the project. Um, so I think even Bitcoin has admitted that, like even now, that that wouldn't happen in Ethereum. So I mean, that 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 speaks to some to some. I mean, I, I'm I'm very much Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. But I feel like like Litecoin, uh, Monero, um, and Ethereum. Um, they have they have kind of roles to play. Uh, uh, and and like Ethereum for me is, is very much um, it's where you can do a lot a hell of a lot of experimentation now and and, and get it to work sort of semi successfully, which yeah. is insanely insanely all that stuff's really hard to do on Bitcoin currently. Um, yeah, so I mean it, it, it's I mean we don't because it just I mean just the just the learning curve is so high and then you you know you are limited. I mean as much as I like Bitcoin. I like it because it's very conservative with its features. You know, you don't want to go and build apps on it. You want to, you know, do payments, and that's fine. And you know, I'm, for example, I, I would say I'm probably more comfortable keeping money in Bitcoin than in Ethereum because of how it's run and what it stands for. You know, but to build stuff. I mean, Bitcoin Lightning is getting there, and I'm sure it will get easier for people to start working on it. But at the moment, it's just not there for us. And apart from anything, I must say, none of our clients would ever even mention it. I mean, so is that is that is that because um, your clients kind of presume that it is? more just a digital uh currency is just digital gold um, whereas they, they 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 have some awareness that ethereum um has been you know programmed from the onset to be more touring complete more touring complete yeah um, well our, our clients come to us for a database so steering them to ethereum is quite easy but steering them to bitcoin i just don't see happening you know they are they have, so they, obviously, they, everybody's very confused about blockchain still. So if they if they want, um, uh, I mean, obviously you're then in that quite hard position of. So I mean, some some if you educate your client as to as to actually what a blockchain is and and what Ethereum is and what a smart contract, what ICOs are, um, and what a tokenized asset is, and why you would use it, uh, uh, and then you know they're they're coming and basically asking for a database. Are you in that? <laughs> do, 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 do you take their money or do you tell them to go and just well, make we, it in place? Well, we steer them towards an idea that makes more sense. I mean, they tend to come with things that literally don't make sense. Sometimes, I mean, rarely. We've got a very a, a client that actually came for cryptocurrencies, right? He works in traditional finance, but he's interested in cryptocurrencies and wanted to build something with cryptocurrencies. But everybody else is just... You know, they just want a, the new database on the block. You know, <laughs> just... I mean, could, could part of that be that they actually they don't care if it succeeds or not, but for them, like it's yeah. good PR to be able to say. Uh, oh, no, it's not right. just that. I mean, they do want it to succeed, and they've read a lot of triumph triumphalist, you know, hypey articles, so they think it's a good technology. I mean, if you don't if you don't know anything, and people are saying this is good, then you know you. You go for it. Um, the truth is obviously that you know uh, they they're really bad databases in general. You know, <laughs> it's the worst database you could probably build on, and you only really need it if you're doing specific things. But uh, but people stay because it does enable things that you can't do otherwise. You know, you can't you can't have trustless computation on a MongoDB. You just can't do that. You know, you have to trust the company. You know. Uh, we have a lot of people in our community in uh, in Estonia who <laughs> who work for Microsoft and Microsoft uh, companies that work with Microsoft, and they're all very um, into blockchain, but they're all extremely skeptical because obviously everything they do just runs on Microsoft. So they mm. do they do private blockchains where all the nodes are run by one company on Microsoft Azure. So. <laughs> So clearly, you know, I mean, that makes no sense, like no sense at all, guys. But that's what a lot of the enterprise blockchain solutions are and what they're talking about is things that literally aren't adver adversarial. You know, there's no 
there's no possible fight because they're all in the same house and talking to each other through the same phones you know that i mean it's just not it's just bullshit but but people when people come to us we take we only work with public blockchains so we try to steer them towards you know build it openly build it you know build it on on a transparent blockchain use cryptocurrencies if you can if you can't uh find a way to at least make it have sense openly because if you don't work on an open blockchain we just don't really we don't we're not interested in working with you yeah i mean i checked out um i checked out decentral.e and it seemed it didn't seem because you you know a scammy website when you see a scammy website don't you like uh any sort of ico type yeah, ethereum world they, they they pop it's the, the the obvious theme forest and it pops out everyone uses theme forest but it sort of like what specifically one of those ico uh themes and it pops off the page and you see i've seen this up a thousand times before whereas with you guys um uh I, I, like i said it, it seems that you're actually genuinely interested in the technology and how businesses can can benefit from that technology so as an example um so say if i was a client now and i was gonna i said to you, you know so give, give me an example of 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 you know this technology out in the wild um using uh, a public blockchain for a business um where it actually made sense well uh it really depends what you want to build there's lots of things that make sense but you know the technology is raw we're not going to hide that to anyone most of the things being built are proof of concepts uh, there are very few working applications which are you know successfully joining the real world with the cryptocurrency world i mean there's a lot of stuff that's pure crypto especially in ethereum you know there's loads of apps that basically shuffle around tokens you know, in some way or do trading in tokens and all of this stuff uh, real companies that use it i mean nowadays you see a lot of uh, consulting firms that are starting to use ethereum to build stuff there was a news of a, a big bank in France issuing a bond on Ethereum. What we we wouldn't talk about that probably, but it kind of depends on what the client, what the industry is, and what they're building. Um, for yeah, but, 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 clients who works in uh, in funds, there's we think there's a lot of uh, potential for working in financial instruments on Ethereum. So that's one of the things that we're pursuing at the moment. So managing yeah. a fund, an investment fund. So, you know, people give you money and you invest it and give them a, a yield. So that's something that can easily be built and with very strong guarantees of transparency, which you don't have normally. Would that be a kind of DAO thing then? Or? Yeah, well, it can be a DAO or it can be a managed DAO or it can be a DAO that elects a manager. Um, that would be the fund uh, the person actually doing the investments but yeah the we work a lot with a framework called aragon which is a framework for DAOs. basically it gives you a kind of uh, almost open operating system interface so you've got a access control list and you've got you know your different layers of applications with permissions and it's very good in our opinion for funds because you can have people come in make deposits uh, make withdrawals, always see exactly how much money everybody is entitled to use, to spend. You know, it's it's real-time accounting in a way that is just not possible at the moment. In the end, it's, yeah, I mean, it's trustless banking. So do you see, I mean, because obviously the, the DAO um, uh, experiment, which everyone is aware of, um, is was, was, was a complete fiasco and, and just got hacked instantly. So do you think that DAOs um, will definitely sort of have a, a presence in, 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 our, in our future as a society? Yeah, I'm bullish on that. <laughs> uh, I, don't think, I don't think this idea will die. So again, like, a, like I said with cryptocurrencies, if this isn't the iteration that will work, the next will. I mean, people have now realized that if they build code that can't be stopped, they can build organizations that can't be stopped and that li outlive the leaders and the founders. And that's just such a powerful idea. So what's, um, uh, so for, 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 for maybe out the viewer who doesn't know, know exactly what a DAO was or wasn't around during the, uh, the, the DAO which was built on Ethereum and didn't, didn't put X amount of money in and lose it, then, <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, then, 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 um, 
can you explain to them uh, what a DAO is? So a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's a concept that's been been talked about for a long time uh, in uh, the cryptocurrency space. Well, a long time relatively to <laughs> to the industry. But uh, I'd say the first incarnation was probably, as you mentioned, uh, the DAO, which was this experiment on Ethereum, which uh, crashed very soon. But the idea is basically that you write a smart contract to manage uh, an organization, and that basically gives the, the organization some rules to accept funds and to spend them. In the DAO's example, for it was basically a distributed investment fund. People would put Ether in, and then they would people would make proposals for investments. And if they reached a very low threshold of votes, then the, that investment would proceed. And if there were any returns, they would be distributed to the token holders. Like so a Kickstarter kind of thing. So it's uh, basically an automated Kickstarter slash shareholder-owned company. So <laughs> I, I like it because it's I see uh, DAOs as an evolution of uh, publicly traded companies. You know, the, like a token as a stock. That's what is interesting to me. So a token that entitles you to governance rights and a share of profits. That's where we will see real democratization of, uh, of wealth creation. See, like, that's the, that, yeah. that, that sort of basic premise is obviously where my lefty socialist ears prick up and I'm like, oh, a co-op. Like, you know, this <laughs> decision making through consensus, like share, the jointly shared um, uh, organization with uh, rights to, to dividends as well, like um, uh, certain profit profit sharing. So, so to me, um, I, I, I get excited about that just on a sort of like a, a, the idea of, of that technology being able to in some way help the formation of, of um, cooperatives. Yeah, well, I mean, look, uh, cooperatives are cool, right? I mean, people work, they own the company, they get money, there's perfect uh, worker management alignment, so people are more happy when they work, there's not as much, uh, uh, what's the word lefties use? Alienation. Exploitation, alienation, okay. yeah, <laughs> not as much as that. I mean, co-ops are great, but they don't work in the real they world. They don't work. Exactly. They, well, I mean, they do. <laughs> there's a few examples, so like, um, I mean, there's some very successful co-ops, but they're not true co-ops. Like, there's a Mondrian Corporation in, in Spain, and they have like yeah, 70,000 but... participants. There's the, if you go to Switzerland, you know, yeah, you'll struggle to yeah. buy food in somewhere which isn't a co-op. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. um, it's funny because I, I have a friend there, and he he mentioned this to me, and he said, no, the, the main supermarket chain is actually, uh, it's just state-owned. And I was like, no, what do you mean it's state-owned? I can't believe that. Supermarket, it was state-owned. And I looked into it. No, and it's it's a co-op where, like, I think a third of the population of Switzerland has a share in, which is crazy. You know, I mean, a third of the population has a share in the supermarket chain. That's that's what, what I love. Really what good. I love about that, though, because I I spent quite a lot of time in Switzerland, and then often you'll have. Um, I remember hearing like a safety interview where he was like, uh, someone said, "I'll oh, give it a good example of like an anarcho-capitalist state," and he's like, "Oh, S Switzerland," and I was like, "Fuck off!" Like Switzerland's like. It, it's it's so well managed. It's decentralized, um, and uh, they have very free markets. But um, they also have like strong cooperative movements. Yeah. Um, they've got a, a strong sort of so they've got socialized their healthcare. They've got the same model as the French model. Um, they've got very good infrastructure, which is paid for by state. I mean, I'm no state socialist. I, I'm interested in the the decentralized. There's room, there's room to improve, then, isn't there? <laughs> Yeah, well, well yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. Um, uh, but no, so I, I always, I always, I always quite like that. That no, I, I think Switzerland's, I wouldn't say socialist, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's like this anarcho-capitalist state. Definitely. Well, um, look, um, just, just to get this out there, like, anarcho-capitalism has absolutely nothing against co-ops or any other form of human organization. That's the whole point. Like get together do whatever you want if the market likes it it will last and if it doesn't it won't that's the whole point you know i mean it's freedom so freedom to 
do cooperatives you know in the end if 50 percent of the population votes vote left it's likely there will be cooperatives you know they're not going to disappear just because the state stops working you know people don't change the same way that uh, that society could you know i mean if if uh, tomorrow the state stops working most people would still want uh you know public health so that would probably happen it would just happen without coercion which is better generally <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you can use like the, the there's a, 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 a few instances where you have like the, you know, anarchism rise up and, and and be successful for a short period of time, and you know, somewhere like the Spanish Revolution in 1936 is is, is one okay example where um, where people did start to self organize. That's where the Mondrian Corporation came from. They, they people start to self organize. They 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 need they needed public infrastructure. They needed to be able to have a, a mode of production, um, and uh, the, the the all the current previous systems had collapsed so so it, it they, they were able to generate those on their own and it worked for a while um and then obviously they, they didn't invest any money in in armaments and guns and that meant that the you know the the commies and the the fascists could come in and just annihilate them but yeah um, but the show is always quite like like the fact that they you give people the freedom uh to to govern themselves and they, that the amount of money they actually pour into um, arming themselves with the military uh, uh, is, is 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 very low, um, so I quite like that bit. So how you get there, isn't it? Um, but look, but not, um, I read a really really good essay about the Spanish uh, Civil War, which I'll, I'll try and look and, and share with you because it it talked about how these self identified anarchists of the CNT and the FAI basically ended up centrally controlling the whole supposedly worker-owned companies because they weren't coordinating. So basically what it said what it said in this article was that when uh, workers were told that they could uh, kick out the uh, kick out the capitalists and own the own the factory, right? That's what they were told. So we're going to have a revolution, we're going to kick out the capitalists and then the the factory will be yours. So when they were told that, they thought that the factory would actually be theirs, like their property, right? But then what happened is that the reality kicked in that what actually was happening was that the central coordination of the of the trade union, the CNT, was actually the owner. I mean, they would come with militia and say, you have to produce this and give it to us and that's it you know it's not yours it's everyone's it's not yours and when reality kicked in that the factory was not actually theirs you know it was more of a everyone's kind of uh, you know utopian kind of uh, it's not really yours we're just saying it's yours kind of uh, way of speaking you know a form of speech not a real thing that people actually started to get really pissed off with the whole <laughs> anarchist movement because it, it's just, you know, people know what property is. I mean, it's just so natural and so yeah, normal but there were, to everyone, there, there, you know? I mean, that, no, absolutely. There, it, wasn't, it wasn't perfect and there were criticisms and there was, there was still um, uh, a lot of corruption in it. Um, but uh, overall, it was a, a very successful uh, anarchist experiment. And there was um, a lot of uh, worker collectives, which, which just, just working on farms and you know um being able to generate um uh, enough food for a village to eat which were which were much more localized and um uh didn't drift to, towards centralization um but this is the issue this is this is this is the, the the my main the main point is i'm a realist and yeah co-ops you know it's so much easier to have a central decision maker and someone who just gives, tells you what to do and then you you do the thing you know then your workers do the thing but that yeah. that, that argument is also a very good argument for slavery. You know, it's so much easier just to have a master and then a slave. Like, don't pay the slave, just take the, get the person, the person, you tell them what to do and they just do the thing and they don't ask questions. If they do, you beat them or kill them or whatever. Um, uh, and then if, you know, feudalism, you, it's so much easier to have a, 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 a real central point of authority which just makes decisions, whether they're good or bad, and then the serfs follow the decisions. But we drift towards more democratic systems. So, yeah. In business, it's so much easier to have the central decision maker currently. Um, but I think if the right technology comes uh, becomes available, then 
there are certain benefits of having um, uh, worker um, owned um, and uh, where, where workers have a, 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 a larger role in the decision making. You have the yeah. wisdom of the crowd. Anyone who's ever worked for anyone knows that depart people who work in a department on the front line working with whatever they are usually very good at making decisions on how that department should go forward as opposed to um uh, a manager who would make decisions which generally like you know um helps the position of the manager i mean obviously you still get very good managers but you know owners or managers where they're they're more interested in in their own position those the, the, those those um often don't align with either the, the 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 what's best for the company or what's best for the people who actually work in the company so i actually think that on a on an efficiency basis given the right technology that a co-op could win out and yeah you're right like so and, you know so in anarcho capitalism if um the technology became available where co-ops were possible um uh and, and could work and they competed with um uh, real world companies and corporations and start to outcompete world world companies and corporations like they, they wouldn't stop that process from happening would they because that's no 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 i mean the, i think the main thing to remember is in the end the only thing that well free market anarchists defend is usually just property rights and freedom right so as long as as long as what doesn't happen is the initiation of violence you know people actually coming and taking your stuff and you know whatever you know you want to you want to live in a commune go for it you know no problem at all in fact it would be easier than now because you wouldn't have to pay any taxes so you know i don't i don't see that there's any issue with uh, a left-leaning uh, free market anarchist uh coexisting with a right-leaning free market anarchist. You know, you can be more or less progressive. The main tenets of uh, free market anarchism are non-violence, well, non-initiation of violence and uh, respect of private property. That's it. And then just, yeah. just go for it. Whatever happens is fine. I mean, the market will find the best solutions for the problems that people have. If uh, Another thing, actually, that's uh, very interesting that I read the other day was how uh, current corporations have to do two things. They have to feed their workers and they have to feed the people who are financing them, the shareholders. But a co-op could basically only feed their workers. So in a sense, uh, like you were saying from an efficiency point of view, they could actually offer better prices because they only need half the margin of oh, yeah. Uh, of a shareholder of the company, you know, I don't, mean, give, don't give Jeff Bezos his X amount of billions a year. Instead, you know, the workers have a small share of that and then they lower the prices. So there's an efficiency there, isn't there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, I mean, the technology is there to do this already on Ethereum for uh, software development, at least. I mean, one of the applications I'm most excited about on uh, Aragon, you know, I was telling you earlier about Aragon, the the DAO framework. So they've recently, one of the teams working, because it's a decentralized, uh, it's a decentralized uh, project. So they work on, there's a lot of teams working on it, right? So what they did is they did an ICO, then the founders started working on it. And then when, the, when it was mature enough, what they did is the founders created a team and started asking for funds from the foundation. And now at the moment, there are three different teams on the same level getting money from the foundation to build this. So it's a very unique structure, I think, in the space. And basically the, the application I was telling you about that was recently developed. Well, that's by interesting. One of these so, teams. So, that, so, that, so, so you've got, so you've kind of almost got like a DAO thing and then you've got these three different uh, departments who then collectively request funds from this DAO. Yeah. Um, so, so, so as a as a corporate as a as a company as a as a um, uh, yeah like an an organization, it's it's kind of unique. I think so. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. How it works is every three months there is a vote, which is an on-chain vote on on their own platform, where people who have tokens from their ICO can go and vote, and you know the requests are like uh, my team would like to join the uh, Aragon flock which are the people who build at the top, or my team would like to join the Aragon Nest, which are people who build smaller things, or my team would like some money to do this experimentation, 
and you know they've got loads of money from their ICO so they've uh, actively funded lots of different projects in the space and honestly I I just love their project I mean it's really really cool to see what can be done in this way you know it's a it's a very unique management structure and it's working you know they're pushing forward they deliver very very good updates and the software is improving visibly and the app that was recently pushed out which uh, i was going to tell you about is basically an app to manage github repos so it can do a lot more stuff but it's optimized so that open source software teams can coordinate and basically manage a pool of funds and pay for the for issues you know on github you have you have your repo and then you've got issues right so oh, we have this bug can somebody fix it so through this app you can assign uh part of your funds say you know a hundred uh dollars or something to one issue and then whoever takes that up and completes it gets the money automatically so what this does is basically you can have open source software which actually moves money you know you can have teams that actually manage themselves so they could actually work as a co-op in some way right if this software has any sales pool the money there decide how to spend it pay salaries um, pay issues pay you know contributors who are not part of the co-op i mean it's really it's it's really um in a way uh creating this vision that uh, you seem to have about uh, work around companies right because they're you have token holders who are basically shareholders and they decide where to spend the money and i mean that's just that's just the dream isn't it yeah i mean no it's definitely it's definitely kind of a step in the right direction it's obviously these things are going to emerge in soft just like open source you know if you, some of those ideals that um, are going to emerge in software first and then um, how, how they then apply to the real world. I mean, obviously, the software developers are the first people to be able to actually use the tools to um, uh, to make these things. So, but 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 then if it could drift into yeah. um, uh, real world uh, organizations, not real world organizations, but you know, like making physical brick and mortar type uh, institutions, um, yeah, that would, well, that would... that's hard. <laughs> yeah, no, that is hard. Yeah, that is hard. Um, uh, but I, I, yeah, I mean, like so. This is kind of my general feeling of the, you know, the, so what percentage of, because obviously you were around during this crazy ICO madness, um, which existed. Um, so what, what, what percentage would you say of that um, investment uh, is actually worthwhile? It's going to build something of, of, of meaningful substance. Uh, are we talking project wise or yes. money wise? Yeah, like, pro, pro, just, just, just as in, as in that money's not just going to whoever ran the ICO and going in their back pocket. Like, what percentage out of the whole ICO industry world thing which existed still exists? Ninety nine. What ninety nine? Look, if you want to round it, just let's just say all of them. Are scams. Well, all, of, all of them are scams. Yeah. But what? What about the? But what? But you said that they they did an ICO, didn't they? And it sounds yeah, like they're yeah. actually money to good work that's, that's why i said if you want to round it i mean i think there are literally you know i don't know how many but exceptions they're all exceptions i'd say the general rule is don't give anyone your money for an ico and then there's exceptions but honestly i think they mostly turn out to be exceptions afterwards i don't think i would have invested in any of these exceptions at the time actually i did invest in one ico one single ico which uh which i'm very happy of what they're doing actually i was i was not surprised uh, i mean i it was one of the first things i came around it's called the uh, cleros i don't know if you've heard of that it's a arbitration protocol that has a very very cool uh, game theory to select uh, anonymous jurors and decide on uh, kind of court cases and it's uh in less than a year, they've put out software that works and is being used at the moment by uh, Bitfinex. You know Bitfinex? They have an Ethereum uh, exchange. And the way you get your, uh, your shitcoin uh, on Bitfinex is by going through uh, an arbitration. 
So if you can pass this arbitration, which is all on chain and managed by Kleros, then your coin can be traded on on. Uh, well, the, at, the, at the, software, the software they developed is actually currently being used by by Bitfinex. It is currently being used. So oh, cool. I mean, I'm satisfied. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in general, no, as I said, I wouldn't have invested in almost any ICO at the time. But I'm happy to say that a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there are a meaningful amount of exceptions that later showed to be real projects. And I'm, you know, good on them. But at the time, I don't think I would have given any of them my money. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe the, um, uh, the idea of just throwing a shitload of money at somebody and then um hoping they, they they make good on their promise maybe that's not the right model maybe maybe somebody can work out to sort of seed financing you know where we a project which people are interested in think may work get some of the funds you know and then and then and have milestones just like in a real uh investment scenario yeah, yeah. absolutely uh, look i don't think the crowd knows how to invest in general i mean investing money is hard um it's it's really hard i mean i did a few investments in this space and i basically lost money every time because it's not my job you know not everybody but I mean, I mean, knows how to do that that's that's pre-ico i mean i do, i mean do you ever go on kickstarter anymore i mean i the amount of kickstarter no. projects i got excited about and paul gave, gave me a little bit of money and i i received like one in five of the, the you know the, the or one in the, the, the of the when i actually like um uh and I, I probably like help fund like you know 20 30 projects and it's probably about one in five of the actual things which i i, I wanted I, I got you know um, the rewards i got so they're just not as scammy they're probably a little bit less scammy because they have got the kickstarter organization there in the middle to to help um uh, okay. yeah, yeah. For, for some bad projects but there's, there's still a hell of a lot of bad projects on there um and it's quite good fun actually if you go on kickstarter and you look at the the campaigns which raised the most um and then you go to the forum bit where you can see all the comments and there's people who like invest in some of these projects and it's years later like five years later and they're going where's my product where's my where's my thing why haven't you made anything blah blah, blah. um and i think kickstart i've got some weird uh, rules like if as long as the person who received the funds continues to be in contact with the people who funded them or something that they can keep the funds or something i don't know but there's, there's this one and it's like the the i don't know if you remember it but it was like a guy and he had this idea for um, a ribbon to be able to send things up into space, like a space lift. And it was like a little box. And he had this like, he had this goofy Dabo where he had this helium balloon with a ribbon on and this little thing going, mm, or this, uh, this ribbon. Uh, and I've, everyone got all excited about it and they poured tons of money into it. And now if you go on the forum, it's just, uh, it's, it's loads of people like screaming at him, like saying that he took their money and he's, you know, he's, 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 a, he's a scammer and all this stuff. And then occasionally he'll just put a little post in there. And it's like a diary extract. It's like, oh, I got up today, thought about doing a bit of work. Then I thought, nah, took the dog for a walk, you know. <laughs> and he like really riles them up and they just get so cross with him. Um, so no, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, equally. Uh, it reminds me of the, um, I can't remember what it was called. I think it was called Scam Coin or something like that. Um, which was a project, well, uh, basically somebody copied uh, an ICO website, but wrote it honestly. You know, they said things like, uh, uh, all the money you give me, I will use to buy drugs and uh, a big TV, I need a new TV. You know, <laughs> the guy got 20,000 euros. Oh my God. I mean. <laughs> yeah. No, I Why not? I was, I was, I was, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. There's so much money sloshing around at that point, wasn't there? I think people just, yeah, incredible. Well, then you've got um, things like EOS, which were just built as a scam. You know, I mean, they've got, they had this rolling ICO, right? The whole year, right? So if you imagine you're doing a fundraising campaign, which is supposed to be transparent and is, uh, Basically, the price is increasing every week, right? And uh, you really want to pump it. So what do you do? Every week, you take the money they gave you, take it out, mix it around, put it back in, 
right? So you right. basically snowball the money so that it goes up to these unbelievable numbers, which are just ludicrous. I mean, they didn't get that much money. I mean, at this point, it seems quite clear that they didn't get one billion or whatever they said they did. I mean, it's clear that it's just money they put in this, uh, themselves because there's no, there's no control. I mean, if they had left the, all the money they got in the contract, we could all check and see how much they got. But they didn't. They moved it out and put it back in. Well, they moved it out. We don't know if they put it back in, but yeah. I mean, I guess they probably did, right? Yeah, I think Brock Pierce did all right on that one, didn't he? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people did very well on that one, actually, because everybody who got in at, at the beginning made a killing. You know, well, that's from, a classic uh, pyramid, isn't it? Well, all but all ICOs are like that. I mean, there's people who made money on ICOs, and you know, and then they went to zero. But that's just how that's just how it works, and why I literally tell everyone don't go into this unless you're a professional trader, because it's just you know, it, it was built the, to scam people. So, do you think? Do you think the, that there is um, uh, some promise with that ice? I mean, obviously. Like you say, there are a few projects you throw crap at wall, and you know, a few projects have, uh, have have come out of it, which are, have have a meaningful product or a bit of software or something they made. Um, do you think? Do you think just ICOs in general are just they should, there's there's no there's nothing to be made from that technology, uh, or do you think that there that there is a way of like improving that technology where in the future um, there may be ICOs, but that the, the, there will be some measures to to make them less scammy or less easy to scam. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, as I said, I did invest in one ICO and it was a late bloomer, if you want. It was in, um, it was last year. So, you know, after the hype, just be well, after the crash. So, I mean, and they were great. They worked, they did what they said and they delivered and they're still working. You know, I mean, it's not about the technology being bad. It's about the fact that you know, in the end, we're talking about a free, decentralized, uh, boundless, controlless world. So clearly, without some kind of way of deciding, it's clearly mostly going to be scams. That's just how people get their money is usually by, you know, lying and getting it from other people. I mean, it's, it's easier to lie your way into money than to work for it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that fundraising is a bad idea i mean fundraising which is democratic like icos were is definitely a good idea um hopefully what? there will be tools to better evaluate and and maybe as you said like in the traditional markets this money might better might be better spent a bit later on you know as a as a second round you know maybe the seed should be private and that's the famous pre-mine that people hate, right? And they sell the pre-mine to seed investors or angel investors and then go public, you know, like normal companies do. Because going public before you have anything basically gives you a huge pot of money, which then doesn't give you any incentive. I mean, what are you working for after you made $4 million in 30 seconds? Like, what are you working for? Well, this is it's just like the dot com era, isn't it? It's the companies where it's, you know, there'd be some guy in his um in his in his in his bedroom and he'd, he'd just get a URL, make up a crappy website, and then he in, in the, during the dot com bubble, he was able to 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 pump that up and get some investment and take it public and um yeah. uh, uh, and this, there was similar similar scamminess and but then eventually we did have some companies and some 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 things like you know Google, which came out of of uh, of uh of that era which did have meaningful products so no absolutely uh, i mean there will be i mean there, there are going to be big things coming out of this space and i think a lot of them will come out of companies that did icos and that's fine you know uh, uh you know it's, it's great honestly i think icos are great and i think tokens moving around so freely and anybody being able to buy into these organizations is also great I obviously, yeah. I mean, we left behind a very long list of dead bodies, but that doesn't mean that we're not moving forward. You know. So what? Um. So other than DAOs or ICOs, is there anything else which you're which you're interested in, which you're currently sort of exploring, uh, building on Ethereum, 
uh, any other kind of technologies or well honestly there's lots of stuff i mean uh, the whole decentralized finance movement i don't know if you've heard of, of that at all but a little bit go into detail for us well i mean it all started when basically uh, MakerDAO started going crazy so MakerDAO is this uh, platform to get uh, loans you know collateral backed loans so that's like when you go to the bank and um, say look uh, this is my house give me some cash and if i don't pay it back you can keep the house right that's a collateral backed loan so basically what they do is they get your eth and they give you back dollars so this dollar they give you back is a stable coin which they give you they create it and they mint it and it's given to you so why is this different to uh, to other systems? This is different because you don't have to ask any permission, right? It's permissionless finance, so you don't you don't depend on the good graces of the bank clerk. You just go deposit your um, your collateral and you get your uh, cash, right? So based on the premise of uh, financial instruments which can work without intermediaries a lot of stuff has been built which is really unique to the space there are uh, other loan platforms uh, which work in a similar way so you you always have to put collateral because there's no identity so there's no way to enforce a normal kind of uh, contract but basically you put collateral and then you get a loan back and then maybe you you do some speculation with that loan and then you pay back the loan and get back your collateral. And there's some models that are basically moving away from how this stuff has normally worked, and they pool all the resources into one. So that, I mean, it, it's very hard to explain if, if you've never heard of them, uh, but uh, things no, I, like uh, Compound Finance or Uniswap are really interesting. Um, they're very easy to use as a, as a lender, Right. So as a lender, you just go and put money in it. That's it. You don't have to decide where or who to give money to. You just put it in a pool of money. And then uh, people who borrow just basically post their lo post their, um, their collateral and they can borrow. And that's it. There's no intermediaries. There's no friction at all. Right. So the premise here is that we can recreate uh, pieces of the financial system to work in a way which is open to everyone anywhere and um, basically without paying uh, very big fees to banks and uh, financial brokers and all those no, I mean, intermediaries. Um, I've, been, I've been very interested for a while. Uh, there's this idea among some Bitcoiners that people aren't going to be able to lend and borrow money um, uh, on Bitcoin and it's just nonsense. Like, Companies are still going to need the ability to be able to, if, if for cash flow issues, if there's a perfectly successful company um, and they have a lot of sort of collateral and assets, that they may need to borrow a, a small, as a lot of companies do, borrow a small amount just to get them through a certain month or a bad month or a yeah. couple of months. Um, and it's still an incredibly successful, you know, productive company. So uh, this idea that, that loans and borrowing money is going to go away is is is, is nonsense. And 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 actually, um, a lot of the tools we're working on. Could really complement that world um for a while i thought it'd be yeah. quite nice on a, even on like a wallet you know like say if i've got you know my eclair wallet um i could say that a percentage of those funds um i want a, a, a interest return on, the, on on that percentage so i could say 50 percent of the funds in my wallet i want to receive um uh you know a percent of interest you know yeah um and then that 50 percent could then be put together in a big pool and then could be lent out to people um uh and then if uh, if someone defaults on the on, on repaying for that pool um it's kind of like a collected pool it would just have to you know just like you know the, how regular normal banks work you know they take your money and then they try well how how banks should work you give them your money and then they they, they invest the money in meaningful investments and then they, they get a return and and they give you some interest for you know to use your money to make an investment um like that's that's plausible and like I'm just having a wallet on a phone. You could do that and you could still have that. So I could still hit, you know, that percentage of funds 
um, uh, and then I, I can still spend that amount. So as, I, as, as the amount and the, the wallet goes down, then obviously the percentage just gets smaller. Um, so I can spend all the funds in my wallet. Um, but just while those funds are in that wallet, there's liquidity there. Like it could be being used for something, you know? Yeah, that's the idea. I mean, in the end, we've been brought up with the idea that money shouldn't sit around, right? That's usually due to the fact that, you know, we use inflationary currencies. So you don't want inflationary currencies to sit around. At the same time, with deflationary currencies, maybe you do want it to sit around. Uh, so the reason people actually take out these collateralized loans is that they think ETH is going to grow. So because ETH is going to uh, grow, let's say, more than the interest rate, it's worth not spending it. I'm better off putting it in this bank, getting cash out, spending the cash, getting the cash back for my work or for my salary and paying back that and keeping the ETH because it's going to appreciate. You know, it's the same. It's like, uh, yeah, basically not not wanting to give away an, uh, an inf a deflationary asset. So that's how it, it was it was born. Yeah, and listen, it's definitely an interesting concept to explore. And I think it's in, in, in some of those scenarios as well, you can also have like front of house institutions. So you could have a bank, um, you know, maybe you could have a free market of banks, you know, maybe you could set up a bank um, where you're, you're, you're loaning money out to people um, and then you build a reputation and then you're able to leverage that reputation um, to, to kind of get more um, of, of, of the interest. And say if I, on my wallet, on my phone, um, maybe there's a whole bunch of like high risk banks, um, which I can uh, which I can select and I want them and then maybe I get a high percentage, but there's also a high percentage of a possibility that I'll lose some money or something. So no, I think it's um, yeah, uh, well, You see that Okay, so there's two things here. One of them is that in none of the decentralized finance apps that are available at the moment you can lose money as a lender you can as a borrower because you, you're usually borrowing to speculate. So, you know, if your speculation is wrong as a borrower, you're going to have to give back more than what you got. But uh, as a lender, they are currently 100% safe. Like there's no default risk. There's no well, default. Isn't there, isn't, isn't there a risk of like some exit scammy type thing if, there's, mm. if, this, if the system no, no. is worst? No, no, no. They're, they're completely trustless. There's no, no one has any keys to, to take anything. That's why ETH is cool and, and we can build on it, you see, because you, the way to make a similar system on uh, Bitcoin is through a trusted party. And I know people who do this. There's a, um, a company in Canada, Ledel, Leden with Hoddle, I can't, I can't pronounce it, but they lend money to based on uh, BTC, right? You send them BTC and they give you cash, but you have to trust them, right? You don't okay, have okay. to trust make a DAO because they, they have no way of taking your funds. The only thing they can tweak is the interest rate. So what they're doing now is in fact to push people out, they're just pushing up the interest rate so that people uh, liquidate uh, their loans because uh, it's currently unstable. That, that's a different discussion. But other protocols who rely completely on the market, so based on supply and demand, they have no counterparty risk. And that's just something that's amazing, really. I mean, at the moment, you can lend uh, DAI, which is the, you know, the dollar peg with a stable coin, for 40% uh, uh, yearly yearly interest rate without counterparty risk i mean that's just unheard of we well, yeah, I'll, I'll let i'll let the experiment play out i mean i this is the thing with some of because people um uh, quite rightly as well they're very skeptical um of, of, because of the, the ico nonsense um because of things like the dow like they're, they're, they're very skeptical over some some of the projects which are but as confidence in, as as you know people um some of these systems prove themselves year on year then confidence will rise and then more people i, I imagine will kind of flood into um uh in, in, into that world um yeah. i think uh, ethereum needs to prove it's stable um even even i know that uh, while saying there's no counterparty risk uh, there is a bit very big platform risk there could be a bug 
you know, I, I don't have the technical capacity to audit uh, contracts and say if they're safe or not. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to do that, you know. Um, and a lot of people have audited the contracts and have said there aren't any bugs. But then uh, I think it was uh, about two months ago, there was a critical update on MakerDAO, you know. So, you know, maybe they did find a bug. You know what I mean? Um, that's the main risk at the moment. And that's definitely there. And it's not and something we can just uh, wish away. The only so you, way for that to help to, to uh, solve itself is just to go forward and test with fire. Well, this is, I mean, so like that's expected of, of Ethereum and that's expected of the community and people who work in, in, in Ethereum, isn't it? That, that, that they can, they're aware of those risks. Whereas um, Bitcoin, obviously is very conservative and it, it chooses to take the other the other the other um uh stance on 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 being more conservative on then you know testing things really testing things before they kind of roll them out whereas ethereum is like move forward quickly and break stuff whatever um but this is why like ethereum clearly has value even if it's just as an experimentation platform um uh, it clearly has value as a system because you can't build these things on Bitcoin at the moment. And uh, uh, it's going to be a while until we are able to build these sorts of things on, on, on Bitcoin at the moment. And like, there's a whole load of things on, on Ethereum now, which are kind of starting to prove themselves as being valid. Um, yeah. So, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's this, this, this kind of been, although I'm not, I haven't, I haven't got any Ethereum or I, I, I don't, um, uh, I haven't bought any ICOs or anything like that. Um, I, I, no, I, I'm very much interested on the amount of, innovative and interesting work which is being done in ethereum and like you say the financial sector is is so ripe for it being disrupted using um, smart contracts uh, and particularly because within the financial sector um there's a lot of people there's a lot of uh, rent seekers you know who could be um uh, cancelled out and and the yeah. system could be made a hell of a lot more efficient um, that's, the, uh, that's the premise, isn't it? I mean, in the end, why doesn't the bank give you more interest? It's not because they're not profitable. It's because they have to feed everyone before they give you interest, right? So, and also banks have a bias towards uh, high, uh, you know, heavy accounts, right? So if you're, uh, so the banks are, are skewed against poor people because if you have a, a small account, you have to pay the bank fees. But if you have a big account, you don't pay any fees. Oh, of course, I mean, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the fact that these protocols don't have that ingrained bias, in my opinion, is also very innovative, you know, and important to push forward as a concept that you can build protocols who, where anybody can access, and there's literally no way of discriminating anyone. And that's just not how the world usually works, you know. Yeah, really interesting, interesting stuff. Um, uh, I think maybe we should sort of wrap it up because I think we've been talking for quite a while. I've not. I, just, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, but I say, honestly, it's just like our, when we bump into each other on Twitter, like we're, you know, I sort of class myself as socialist. You're much, very much more free market. Um, uh, uh, what, what would you an anarcho capitalist or? Uh... I don't like labels. Yeah, label. What, what label are you? Also, I must say, I don't like the word capitalist. I prefer talking about free markets because yeah, we, we all participate in the market. Capitalism like it. Mr. Monopoly with a pipe and all that stuff, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. But we're all participating in the market. Everybody, every day, making any kind of decision is a market-based decision. And that's something that's just ingrained in the human brain. Capitalism is, uh, is a word that was invented to talk about the rich guy who has a bag of gold and that's not me so maybe, maybe one day what's that maybe, maybe one day uh, i don't i don't think so but yeah. but markets uh are what make what make uh, everything successful possible so this is so why I, like, I hate being like a marx fan because i'm not like a but it's why i always kind of return to marx because marx he wrote extensively on 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 the how incredible markets are, free markets are, and, and the amount of value they've given to the world and to humanity, and um, the, the amount of productivity we have in a market. But his premise was their stability over time. So um, 
you know, look at the environmental impact of overproduction and consumption and um, look at some of the challenges which we're going to face, have to face as, as a human race. Like, so he said that he arrived at socialism as in, as in, you know, capitalism isn't, it's, it's not, you can't just do this thing forever and it, it will just, it will just reach an equilibrium. You know, that idea of an equilibrium for him was, it, and, and for the, you know, like a, a, lot, a lot of people, it can't, it, it won't be found naturally through a free market, even Hayek or, you know, Keynes, like they, they knew that, or they thought that um, uh, capitalism inherently geared towards m sort of monopoly and uh, it would, in, in order for to make it work, there would be, need to be some form of control. And Marx said, well, actually, if you leave capitalism, just go eventually, then you'll end up with these big monopolies and you'll end up with this sort of a revolution, which happens. Um, I'm more, I'm more of the opinion that that a natural equilibrium can't be found when dealing with humans. Uh, so um, uh, if you do leave, that's a bold statement. <laughs> I, I find that a very bold statement that no equilibrium can be found. I just, I just don't, I just don't think it's, I don't think it's likely that you're going to find an equilibrium between between buyer and seller when you've then got, you know, the the so. And it, 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 when say when Marx talks about an equilibrium, that would be the, the point in which you've made something and then sold that thing, and then you're basically paying for the cost. Oh, you're basically paying for the cost of production. Um, uh, that would be kind of the equilibrium point. Uh, whereas, um, that's, look, this all stems from the fact that Marx doesn't understand prices. His theory of value is just completely. Or from another world, it doesn't make any sense because things aren't. Look, I mean, you you have Bitcoin, right? I don't have to explain to you that things aren't valued based on how much it costs to make them. That's not how things are valued. Yeah, but that's what Mark said. That's what Mark Mark said. That exactly. yeah, that's what Mark says. But that but that's not true. No, no, no. Right? What Mark said. He said. He said. Mark said that things aren't on on the prices of things aren't based on the cost of production. That's the that that's right. not. That's the that 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 will be the, the distortions which happen between the exchange value and the market value, which he wrote but about. His his, um, his premise is that things should be priced and are usually priced by what they cost to make plus what the capitalist steals from you. Right. Yeah. Well, so this, he, is, this is the premise, but that's not true. I mean, because things can cost a lot to make, but be impossible to sell. And if they're impossible to sell, they don't have value. Well, that returns. That would return to use value. So you start with use value. So if something's useful, or not, and you've got the socially necessary labour time, that that it's, it's irrelevant whether if you, the mud pie argument, is, you know, the, you make a mud pie and it has got value, blah blah blah. Like Marx was very well aware that like it needs to have use value, and then some things have more use value than other use other things. So in his theory of labour, he spoke about use value, spoke about exchange value, spoke about market value. Um, market value and exchange value kind of close, very close together. But the dust, there's, there's distortions which happen along the way where use value becomes distorted, and then the the price of something doesn't have to reflect this actual use value. It could reflect just you know brand, for example. Um, but the fact is, there's no way to determine use value if you don't have a market. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you need the you need the free market, and he wasn't. You know, he didn't. He, he, Marx didn't create the the, the idea of um, uh, central price planning. That was that that's that that was something which came after him. You know, through people like Lenin and the uh, and the the, the 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 state socialist movement um, or state capitalist movement. So uh, he was very. This is why he was very blurry and fuzzy on how any sort of um, uh, shift from capitalism to socialism would work because uh, he knew he, he knew the power of free markets. Like he knew how important they were, particularly for finding something like price, you know? Uh, um, uh, so uh, anyway. So Marx this, was a free market guy. That's he was good. a free market guy. There's actually a lot of, a lot of uh, socialists think that, uh, a lot of people think that economists as well, uh, people who've actually read Marx and read Capital, that, um, that there is a thing called free market socialism, which is, social people who probably be a bit like me like i appreciate a free market and i want kind of socialism to kind of happen through free through a free market almost um and uh there's a lot of people who would class marx as a free market socialist um he did say he wasn't a marxist so there we are uh, <laughs> the first time i've heard that uh, but great you know i mean uh honestly if we can agree on lack of coercion and free markets there's not much else to discuss that's yeah. why that's why I always come at you saying you're a socialist, 
because uh, to me, generally, socialism means coercion. It means forced collectivization. You know, it means redistribution. You know, but well, if, I mean, this is, this if you this can get over that, you're not a socialist, in my opinion. This is, well, this, is, this, is the, this is the technology issue, though, isn't it? It's like, how do you have workers owning the means of production without you know some sort of revolution uh, which involves you know the the bourgeois having their, their their stuff taken from them like how how does that happen um and just again competing in the market why this not? is why i return to marx because like because he was he was just fuzzy on it he was just like i don't know it will happen i don't know how it's going to happen it's probably and in the communist manifesto he talks about this sort of proletariat revolution and um he thought that because of previous revolutions had been quite like the French Revolution that they, they could he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't uh, advocating anything he was just it was just this is probably how it will go down but I, I don't know no one knows um, and I think that's probably a wise stance to take that's the sort of stance I've got is that I want you know workers to own the means of production but God, I don't know how we get that I don't know um, I do see value in things like DAOs so to be honest that's probably why we kind of get on because we we you're you, your interest is in the technology um, uh, for the thing which I, I kind of see value in. Um, and as a Bitcoiner, like, you know, you can't find many Bitcoins to talk to talk about DAOs and, you know. Um, uh, yeah, it's not it's not on the um, on the approved uh, topics. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, probably a good note to end on that is all, all this technology is being uh, explored and um, uh, it will have an impact on our world, and there will be there will be there will be projects, and there will be, you know, DAOs and um, tokenized assets, and um, uh, I mean, why Dai spoke about, you know, didn't he speak about sort of smart contracts and 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 and, and trying to um, uh, maybe not ICOs? No, I don't want to want I don't want to quote why Dai without knowing what I'm talking about. Um, uh, so no, so the, these things are being built, and and to to, to completely exclude. Um, the Ethereum world or whatever, or just because uh, it's not being built on Bitcoin is 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 ludicrous. Like you know, keep your yeah, eye on. Hmm? I, I agree. I mean, it's it's ludicrous to to put. Uh, I don't know how you call this, uh, but you know, horses when they um, when they're pulling carriages, they they put these things so they can only look forward, right? I feel Link. a lot of Bitcoins are a bit, bit Bitcoiners are a bit like that. Sometimes they don't recognize innovation when they should uh try and learn you know, well this is this, this is this is the problem like this is why I, I was so against that kind of maximalist movement um because it it, it it's a, a that's a negative feed like loot who's who's the most ignorant who's the most like um because there's it's like no true scotsman like you're you're not a bitcoin maximalist because a bitcoin maximalist does this well you're not a bitcoin maximalist because bitcoin maximalist does this and you end up rendering down this smaller and smaller pool of people like exclusive pool of people who I mean, do, do they really represent Bitcoin? Um, I actually, like, there was an interview I saw with Vitalik, and he was saying that they were asking him how he first got into Bitcoin and why he was interested in Bitcoin. And he was saying that there was such di when he first got into Bitcoin, there was such a, a diverse amount of opinion and thought and uh, interest, and, and everyone was excited about all this technology which this thing could allow. And and then over time, now Bitcoin's kind of it feels like it's, it's not. It's actually widening because the the tools are slowly being built. But um, kind of this, uh, this. I mean, monoculture. I can, pardon? Um, monoculture. Yeah, the mon. Yeah, that's a good word. But mon monoculture, and I can see. I mean, that is a direct cultural reaction yeah. to all the scamming and stuff which has gone on. So I can see yeah. why it's emerged. But you don't want to find yourself like within that monoculture where you're you are completely a putting all your faith into this technology, which could not work tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. But, um, but look, that's. This is why, at the moment at least, I, I very much prefer the Ethereum community because in Ethereum you've really got diverse opinions, like very diverse opinions. Like you've got people who are socialists, you've got communists, you've got even people who are ascetic, you know, very, very weird <laughs> things that people say sometimes. And then you've got, you know, Bitcoin style. Conservative. You know, anarcho capitalists not many conservatives you see it's because it's just not the space for conservatives you know but you do have people who talk about sound money and austrian economics in the ethereum space too 
Mm. So yeah. interesting. You know, as you say, diverse opinion usually breeds a, a more uh, vibrant community and a more interesting uh, discourse. And I think that's that's true at the moment. In Ethereum, there is more diverse opinion and conversations are generally more interesting. Well, you look at look at look at any society which was like radically propelled forward, um, uh, and it, it was through different cultures or different people suddenly being in the same space together. You know, you, you, yeah, so, so uh, different, different traditions of thought being in the same space together, where they were able to ex exchange ideas. Um, what, what are you ref like? What do you mean? Do you mean well, the I mean, US like the interesting US? points? Interesting points of history, like peacetime. I don't know during the Crusades where. Like the uh, the uh, uh, Islam uh, Muslim people and Christians, they were together and they were in, were in shared community and they're actually exchanging ideas and thoughts and 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 some of the sort of the, the maths and science from the, the Islamic world was able to get into the sort of Christian world and then vice versa uh, and then and then you look at like you know parts of Greece which which like you look at um, and this is playing into the sort of capitalist thing but those the, when you have like trade routes trade routes where lots of people collide. And uh, ideas and 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 and, and thoughts uh, are exchanged. Then you have kind of like a, a sort of vibrant society which um, produces like I mean it just makes sense. Like if you have if you have more um, ingredients you have access to, then you're more likely to be able to make interesting interesting dishes, aren't you? So um, uh, so if you have lots of different opinions and thoughts and uh, 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 you have lots of discussion, then then. then uh, you can you can have sort of more interesting results yeah. from from that. Absolutely. I think absolutely. Um, so um, end, I think we all we're all agreeing on a few premises, which are generally uh, non expropriation, so private property in some way, and uh, free freedom, freedom, free markets, free exchange, free free enterprise. So th th those are the main tenets of Ethereum. Decentralization as well, decentralization. But yeah, but decentralization is necessary. It's not it's not something you necessarily want or need. It's just necessary for this technology to be resilient. Mm. You know, if it if it could be resilient without being decentralized, then we might consider it. But it's I don't see how that could possibly work, you know. No, it's not possible. That's the point. So like in a fair in a fair system it needs to be decentralized or, you know, as I would yeah. call so but there we are. What's that? As I would say, socialized. Well, Just I agree to some extent. I mean, what does socialized mean for you? That the uh, distrib that the ownership is very distributed. No, well, decision making. Decision making is distributed. Yeah. Well, I, I would uh, I would probably argue that uh, all most proof of work and in some way proof of stake blockchains are socialist then if you want because the decision making is distributed how does proof of because so proof of stake because i'm you know i'm biased proof of work so uh, <laughs> we're never, never going to end this 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 discussion are we? uh how does how does proof of stake um how is that decentralized because i to me proof of stake feels a lot more when people particularly in bitcoin is when they attack uh, proof of stake i often think that it's kind of more capitalist because uh, you have the people who own the capital are the ones making the decisions um the people who own the largest stake are the ones making the decisions um, um yeah. but that was, hmm? well look i think the goal of these platforms and what they should aspire to is to make the least amount of decisions like they should be as neutral as possible to start with okay after that um I would also argue that in uh, proof of work, you also need capital to participate in some way. You can't just, you know, find an ASIC rig on the street. You know, you have to buy it, and to buy it, you need cash. This is why I was interested in what uh, proof of stake, because obviously proof of work, like um, on a superficial level, you're right. You need the capital to be able to buy a mining rig and blah blah blah. Um, but then on a on on, a, on a, actually. You know, the people who run the node software, they're the ones who control the users. Um, even if you don't run node software, even if you're a user and you're able to engage on a, a social media platform or something, then you can have um, you can have a vote. You can. It's the, it's the kind of it's how do you how do you have decision making through consensus on your your user group? 
Um, and, and I say proof of work is, is decentralized decision making, socialized decision making um, by the users, by the community as a whole. But superficially, you're right, like proof of work it implies that it's the people who are able to afford to pay for the work to be done who end up with the, with the, with the who, who make the decisions. Um, so yeah. I just like in proof of stake, like maybe I'm being too superficial. I'm looking at it and I'm saying, well, it's the bag holders. It's the guys who've got all the money. They're the ones who make well, the it decisions. Is. Let's just not let's just not avoid that. It is, uh, it is the people who have the bags. Uh, now, the question is, how many people have the bags? How well distributed is that? Is that money? And is that an issue at all? Uh, I don't think it is. Honestly, I'm not a Democrat, so could, that, know, <laughs> could that could that could that not be an issue because the um uh, the community as a whole um, can lean on those people and say, "Well, we don't. We want this, and we want that." And if 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 they if they go against the community as a whole, then um, their thing will be, their bags will be worth less value. So is they have they're incentivized to keep the users happy in a proof of stake system. Well, look, let's uh, put it this way: if I had ninety percent of ETH, right? So I've done a really really cool pre mine, and everybody's happy with it. What would I do? I would probably try and distribute that a bit and keep people happy because that's the only way to push up the price. So, yeah, I mean, I don't see an issue with the bag holders being the decision makers because I think bag holders are the people who are most incentivized to make the right decisions. Um, on the other hand, would you want... Imagine tomorrow, um, imagine, you know, you're, you have a democracy and it's a headcount democracy and it's co-opted to do something which goes against the interest of token holders, right? They would just fork, fork the chain and, and, go, and go back to bag holder vote. Yeah. Right? Because in the end, the bag holders are the people who have the best incentive to keep the bags worth money. So I'm not, I don't see that as an issue, to be honest. I just don't, I just right, don't. Okay. See so quickly now, you've got to choose one, life or death, proof of right. work, or proof of stake. Yeah, I'm just going to stay on the island on my own. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Proof of, I don't know. Honestly. <laughs> no, I don't, don't worry, don't you try to, it's too hard, it's too hard. Question. Proof of work, proof yeah, of yeah. work. Proof of work, we can agree on that one. But I think, again, proof of stake, obviously, like proof of work is uses up so many resources and um, uh, other other uh, ways of reaching decision making should be explored, definitely. Um, uh, well, there we are. I think, should we, <laughs> should we, should we call this, a, should we call it a day? We should, yeah, I think it was a day, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but that was cool man uh it was really interesting really interesting chat i could i could talk for hours one day we'll have to meet we'll have to have a beer and do, do it in face to face yeah i, I want to see all the all the hardware you build are you going to the you going to the lightning hack day in munich no no, no. Uh, i don't think i will but it would be interesting i mean it's definitely on my bucket list to start working with uh, lightning unfortunately i haven't really had the chance to even start but it's on my bucket this so yeah you should um uh honestly the the the, the hack day is a really good place to start because we have, there's a lot of people who turn up who, who really don't know anything you it's such a small sample of people um uh, it's not like a big conference there'll be you know maybe a couple of hundred people there or something and you'll have um you know you'll have people like christine decker there. you'll have like you know maybe some of the lnd people there you'll have some really influential people but then you'll also have within that hundred people people who who don't really know anything. They're just really interested in, in learning about the technology and they, they, they just want to turn up and learn about it. Um, uh, so, uh, no, if you can get get to one of the Lightning Hack days. So the, there's one in Munich at the end of this month, which is going to be fantastic. And I, 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 I've I heard gossip that the next one, one day, will be in, in Berlin. Um, and if you can get if you get if you can get to the next one after the, um, one of the hack days, if there's if there's a few hack days, this uh, Lightning Hack days this this year, they're, honestly, they're, they're great events because it's... Um, it's very much a maker um, yeah. atmosphere. There's people hacking away. There's people building stuff. There's people having really profound and interesting discussions. Um, uh, so yeah, you should definitely come to one of those, and then we'll we'll get that beer then. Eh? Yeah, 
Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds like a, okay. and maybe you can join us for one of the Ethereum events too. Oh God! Oh God! Oh, is that what happens? It's like, a, oh no, <laughs> that's a bit and of a you can watch people dancing and uh, Metallica. yeah, wearing unicorns on their heads and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. Okay, we can have the beer with a unicorn uh, uh, onesie on. Do they drink beer? The, the Ethereum crowd. I thought they might drink um, something. Oh, I do. I'm part of the crowd, so <laughs> that's all you need. I thought they might want something more flamboyant. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll catch you again. That was really good. Thanks, Francesca. All right. Nice talking to you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.